Hello, and welcome to episode 40 of Sam Splaining Science. I'm Sam. I'm your host. I'll be Sam Splaining the Science. And today we're talking about setting goals with science. Again. That's right. We're going to do a call back to the very first episode of the podcast. Let's get into it. Hi, everyone. How are you? I hope you're doing well. If you're listening to this on the day that it comes out, then Happy New Year's Eve. And if you're listening to it a little after it comes out, then Happy New Year. I hope your 2023 is off to a good start. Um, This is the 40th episode. We made it. Like I said in the last episode, I made it by the skin of my teeth to episode 40 by the end of the year. Um, There was really no reason in particular other than in my head, 40 is like a much better number than 39 to end on. (laughs) Like it's even, it's like a round number. 40 was just, I wanted to get to 40. Um, (laughs) And that's the best reasoning I have is just because I wanted to do 40. Um, So I'm very happy that we're here at episode 40 released on the very last day of 2022. Um, And in keeping with the general theme of ending one year and starting a new one and with that a lot of people like to uh, plan new goals for themselves in the new year I figured that I would do another episode about goal setting Um, if you've been listening since the very beginning first of all thank you love you second of all um, you might remember that the very first episode that I released in January of 2022 was about setting goals with science And I think a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today is also in that episode, but I hope that my presentation skills have improved. I hope my communication skills have improved. I hope my podcast editing skills have improved. So hopefully this episode will be a little bit different and different will be better. At least I will think so. Um, I hope you do too. So without further ado, let's get into the questions for today's episode. Um, actually I should say I didn't go back and listen to the first episode, but I did review the episode notes and, um, I did notice that like in the episode notes, I didn't really have my question, um, segment. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but if you've caught on every episode has like multiple questions that I address and I talk about. Um, And episode one did not have questions. It was just like me regurgitating science, which was without any structure, you know, which is kind of chaos, Um, which is kind of, I am chaos, so I guess it makes sense. But I kind of like having the question segment and I didn't have really like takeaways like I do now. And I didn't have my sign on and my sign off. So If you're going to listen to one goal-setting episode of mine, listen to this one. Don't listen to episode one because it is kind of a hot mess. And although that hot mess is authentically me, it probably won't benefit you if you're trying to, like, use science to set better goals for yourself, okay? So stick around. Hopefully you'll get a few good scientific tips to improve the way you set and achieve your goals. And now let's get into the questions. So there are two questions for today. The first one is, what science back tips am I using to achieve my 2023 goals? I and my meaning Sam, hello, me. Um, so basically using the, the results and the findings of goal setting theory, I am going to implement that in order for me to set and achieve my goals for next year. Um, and I kind of picked out a couple that I'm using and if you wanna use them as well, go for it. Um, If you don't, no worries. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Um, (laughs) But maybe, you know, you'll hear some things and it'll resonate with you and you'll take it with you into this new year. Um, And then the second question is a more personal question. It's what are my 2023 goals? So first I'll kind of talk about the tips that I'm using to set and achieve my goals and then I'll get into the specifics of what exactly my goal for 2023 is, at least with respect to the podcast. Uh, I'm not going to get too personal, but it'll be relevant to the podcast here. Um, So for the first episode, episode one, I cited a lot of work about goal setting theory that was put 
implemented by um, two social scientists or behavioral scientists, psychologists, um, Locke and Latham. And for this episode, I am also citing a lot of work that was done by Locke and Latham. Specifically, I read through a textbook chapter that they wrote, which is linked below. The chapter is called Breaking the Rules, a Historical Overview of Goal Setting Theory. Um, so if you want to check it out for yourself, uh, it's linked below, so feel free to do that. Um, but for this episode, I read through it and I picked out a few things that like really stuck out to me and sort of things that I have heard about in my life about goals and, um, and kind of structured it that way. So if you don't really get anything out of this episode and you want to learn more, you can go to the textbook chapter and then the, the references that are in that textbook chapter if you want even more information. Cool. So let's start with question one. What science back tips am I using to achieve my 2023 goals? Um, so we're going to start with some empirical studies that were led by Dr. Locke. He looked at experiments with, quote, internal validity. That's a direct quote from the textbook chapter. But basically what he did was he looked at individual performance uh, in setting and reaching goals within lab experiments. So essentially in controlled environments, he would recruit participants to these studies where he would ask them to set goals and work towards achieving them in like a lab setting. So there were a couple of themes, I guess, that uh, Dr. Locke's work uh, contributed to in forming the goal setting theory. And those themes are going to be summarized here and sort of what I'm taking away from these themes. The first theme is the goal itself, right? Starting with the goal, setting the goal itself. Studies have shown that the most successfully achieved goals have a few things in common. And those things include being specific and challenging. So performance towards a goal improves when a particular goal is specific and challenging versus when a goal is vague and easy. And this, of course, goes within the limits of a person's ability, right? I can't say I'm going to you know, grow wings and fly to Massachusetts when that's like physically impossible. I am unable to do that, right? But you know, I can make other goals that are actually within my limits and my abilities. Um, so long as they are challenging and specific, my performance will be greater than if I set a more general or vague or like easy goal. Um, you might remember from episode one, if you listened, or just like in your general day-to-day -day life, you might have heard of something called SMART goals. And I wanted to sort of point this out. It was not specifically outlined in the textbook chapter, but it's something that I've come across in like professional development, um, workshops and stuff like that, is the importance of setting SMART goals, where SMART is an acronym. So I wanted to sort of outline that here for you all, because um, I think it's really helpful. And I think a lot of the SMART, the aspects of SMART goals are proven through Locke and Latham's work. Um, so I sort of wanted to outline that here. So the S in SMART stands for specific, right? And that's what this bullet point is telling us is that performance improves when goals are specific. So you want a detailed description of what you want to achieve. In the previous goal setting episode, I gave the example of read more. Read more is not that good of a goal because it's not very specific, right? You want to say, oh, I want to read 40 books this year or whatever, however many books you want to read. You want to be specific. Um, and being specific helps because it gives you a, like a general direction of where to work towards. Um, so S is for specific. M is for measurable. Um, having a goal that is measurable is important because it helps you to track your progress and it helps you to know when you've achieved your goal, right? If we're sticking with the example of reading books, if I want to read 40 books in a year, I can measure 
with each book I complete, I can like make a tally, you know, and, and count how many books I've read so that I can, you know, keep track along the way and say, okay, well in June, hopefully I've read at least 20 books because the year is half over. So hopefully I'm halfway towards my goal. Um, so it's just helpful to measure so that you can track your progress, right? Read more is not measurable. You can't measure more um, unless you, you know, want to get technical about counting your books from this year and then counting them from last year. It's, it's too vague and it's not as measurable as reading 40 books. So that's M. The A is for achievable. And this is something that I sort of alluded to, having it within a person's ability. Achievable is just to make sure that it's possible for a person to achieve it, right? You can't grow wings and fly somewhere, but you can, you know, if you know how to read, you can read a book. You can read multiple books. Um, just making sure that it's within your own limits and within your own abilities, um, and that takes knowing yourself and knowing what you can do and knowing what you can't do. Um, but when you have that information and you're able to recognize what you're able to do and what you're unable to do, um, that puts you in a position to make goals that are achievable for you. Um, and that's important too, right? For you. Don't make your goals based off of somebody else. Make it based off of what you're able to do. Um, because you are the only one who can ultimately do your goal. Nobody else is going to do it for you. So that's A. R. So the last time I did this, actually, I said R was for realistic. Um, but to me, realistic and achievable really feel like the same thing. Um, I guess really it's a point to like consider uh, adversity, consider like a worst case scenario of what could happen, what could go wrong, um, which I guess is, is a little different than achievable. But I think recently I found a smart goal summary that used the R as relevant. And I think I like that a little bit better. So basically when something is relevant, it's related to you, right? Like you want to set a goal that's re relevant to your life. I wouldn't set a goal to, I don't know. I wouldn't set a goal to go to space because I'm not an astrophysicist and I don't, it's not relevant to my life, right? Um, whereas if somebody was an astrophysicist or an astronaut, obviously, that would be relevant to their life. It would be relevant to their interests and their, you know, their career goals. So having a relevant goal and making it about your life or like close to your life and your values creates a stronger goal that you're more likely to succeed in, succeed in achieving. And then T, the last letter, is timely or time-bound. And this basically encourages you to set deadlines for your goals, right? To say, oh, I want to read 40 books in the next year. Um, you have that by next year, by December 31st of 2023, I want to have read this number of books. It gives you a deadline and it gives you something to work towards where as you're measuring M, your progress, you also know how much time you have left and how to like adjust your rate of reading, for example. So that is SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic or relevant, and timely goals. So those goal, when you set a goal for yourself, you want to sort of check off all of those boxes and make sure your goal is specific and measurable and achievable and all these things because it uh, increases the likelihood that you will achieve that goal. Okay, so that's SMART goals. Um, but getting back to the textbook chapter, um, the studies have suggested that having specific goals and having challenging goals um, improve performance when you're working towards that goal. So the first science back tip that I'm going to follow 
and if you want to follow, you can follow as well, is to make sure that my goals are specific and um, ambitious, right? Not too challenging, right? They have to be realistic and achievable, but not too easy because if it's too easy, then performance um, may not be as strong as if it was a more challenging goal as the data has shown. So the next, so that's goals in general. The next tip is about feedback. Feedback is very important and I kind of alluded to it when we were talking about having measurable goals, right? When we can like count how many books we've read and how many we have left before the end of the year. Um, feedback is important because it helps us assess our progress towards our goal. Um, particularly if our goals are measurable, if they're quantifiable. Um, we can get feedback every so often, maybe every month or every three months or every six months, and sort of count or measure the progress that we've made. And from that, we can also determine how our performance is, right? If we're reading too slow. If we're, you know, if we want to read 40 books in a year, we need to read like a book every week and a half ish. Um, but you know, if I've read one book in the month of January, I'm behind. So if I want to reach that 40 book mark by the end of December, I got to pick up the pace and I can only get that. I can only come to that conclusion that I need to speed up with proper feedback, right? With understanding the progress that I've made and how much I have left to go before I reach that goal. Um, so regular feedback is helpful to keep us on track with our goals. Um, so for me, I know that my goals, which I'll get into in a little bit, I have a plan to regularly, monthly, evaluate my progress over the past month and keep track of that for each month over time um, because feedback will tell me you know, how my progress is going and it'll tell me, okay, like if I had really good progress this month, I know what I did this month to, to improve that. Or versus if I didn't have great progress this month, okay, what do I need to work on? And it gives you just sort of a better idea of how you're working towards your goal and what you need to do to get there. So that's the second tip is to implement feedback into working towards our goals. So once our goals are set and we start working toward them, we need to make sure that we're staying on track with meeting them. So be conscious and, and schedule times for feedback to um, evaluate how, how you're doing. Don't just save it till the end of the year. Do it somewhat frequently over time. So in the textbook chapter, um, the textbook chapter says that people need feedback to assess their progress in pursuing a goal and to determine whether they need to exert more or the same effort. So kind of what I just rambled about, right? Um, so that's the second tip, is to implement feedback into your goal achieving routine or working towards achieving your goal. Make sure that you schedule some time for feedback. The third tip is about expectancy and self-efficacy. So expectancy is sort of like expectations, right? It's the, it's the likelihood that this will get done. Self-efficacy is how certain you are in your ability to do things, to do, you know, to achieve your goal, right? So the textbook chapter says that choice or motivation um, is affected by the expectancy or the likelihood of experiencing success, valence or value or reward, and instrumentality, where instrumentality is basically the likelihood that receiving a reward is directly related to the effort that you put in. So essentially, the motivation of working towards this goal will be affected by the success, like whatever the end point of the goal is, the success, um, the rewards that you get from that success and the relationship of the effort that you put into that reward. But when we think about this, it's a little contradictory, right? Because 
Studies have shown that hard goals have lower expectance. So when you set a goal for yourself that's super, super challenging, like almost arguably out of your realistic achievement, um, it's very unlikely that you'll expect it to happen, if that makes sense. Like hard goals, more challenging goals have lower expectance. But we also know from other studies, as we talked about earlier, hard, more challenging goals have higher performance, right? Performance improves when goals are more challenging. So it's sort of contradictory, these two findings from these two separate studies about how harder goals have higher performance, but also harder goals have lower expectance. And it's like, well, if you're not expecting to get the goal, why are you performing so well at it, right? And this is where self-efficacy comes into play. So self-efficacy is how certain you are in your ability to do things. Almost like confidence is how I'm reading into this, right? Self-efficacy is positively related to how people set their goals. And it is also positively related to people's performance in reaching these goals, right? So if I am confident that I can do something, um, I will keep that in mind as I'm setting this goal. And then I will also perform in such a way that I will succeed in reaching that goal if my confidence is there to succeed. Um, so this is the third science back tip that I'm taking with me is that um, if I feel and I think and I believe that this goal is possible for me, I can reach it. Um, it's not really a tip so much as it is just like, I guess it's a mindset tip, right? So setting realistic and achievable, but also challenging goals for myself. If I think that I can do it and I know that I can do it, I will do it and I will do it well. So it's really just like a mindset sort of thing. Um, but that's another tip that I'm taking with me is that it is about mindset and it is about self-efficacy. And do I feel like I am capable of doing, of achieving this goal? So that was the third tip. The fourth tip is about commitment. Studies have shown that commitment has a positive relationship to performance, right? So with higher commitment to reaching a goal, there's higher performance when working towards that goal, especially when goals are difficult or challenging. So this is the fourth science back tip, is to be committed to the goal. Um, I need to make sure that my goals are centered around something that I'm committed to, right? And something that I can stay committed to, something that I value, something that matters to me. Um, and then that way I can stay with it, you know, stand behind it all the way through, see it all the way through. And I think this is sort of where the R in the SMART goals comes in, but like the relevant R, right? Where we're saying, I want something that's relevant to my life because it's easier to stay committed, to stay behind something that's relevant to me, right? If there's something that I don't interact with and I don't relate to and I don't care about and I make a goal about it, it's gonna be easy for me to forget about it, right? Or like not care about it. Versus if I know that something is aligned to my morals or aligned to, you know, my life in any way, it's relevant to me, I'm going to stay committed to it. And then studies have shown that commitment has a positive relationship to performance. So if I'm committed to it, I'm going to do well in reaching my goal. So that's the other tip that I'm taking, another tip that I'm taking away is to stay committed to my goal. And I guess that's something that I'm going to keep in mind as I'm working towards my goal, but it's also something that I'm going to keep in mind as I form my goals, right? As I write out my goals and what I want, I need to make sure that it's realistically something that I can stay committed to. So commitment is another tip. Okay. So the next tip is about affect. It's about mood. I hate the word affect in science because I never read it as affect, like when I'm reading papers, I always read it as effect. 
And it takes me a minute because I'm a little stupid to be like, oh, they meant affect. They meant mood. Why wouldn't they have just said mood? Because why? Scientists are difficult. And sometimes they're stupid. Um, but this tip is about affect or satisfaction, right? I think we can all sort of infer and agree just from anecdotal life experience that spirits are higher when you achieve what you set out to do. It's kind of like, duh, right? Affect or mood is greater when goals are achieved versus not achieved. That makes sense to me. Who celebrates when they lose? You know, everybody celebrates a win. If you're celebrating a loss, you're confused, you know? Um, so this was sort of obvious, right? Greater affect occurs when goals are achieved. But when they dug a little deeper into this, they found that easy goals had better satisfaction scores than more difficult goals. So, you know, the, like the saying low hanging fruit, I don't know if you've heard that saying before. I think I use that kind of a lot actually because I'm lazy and I always go for the low hanging fruit. Um, but it's basically like if you're at, you're in an apple orchard or, a, you know, you're picking peaches or I don't know what else grows on trees. You know, I've actually never gone like apple picking or fruit picking at all, actually. But if, if we have an apple tree in front of us and there's apples all over the tree, the easiest apples to pick are the ones that are hanging low. So I don't have to reach that hard. You know, I don't have to, I barely have to extend my arm to pick the apple off the tree if it's hanging low versus the apples that are all the way on the top of the tree. I might need a ladder. I might need to stand on somebody's back while I reach up and extend my arm all the way to reach up and get that apple and pick it. Right? So easy goals are the low hanging fruit. Easy goals are, this is totally within reach for me. I don't have to struggle or strain myself to get this apple. Whereas the more difficult goals are like, you got to reach a little bit, you know, you got to say, Hey, can you, do you mind going down on your knees or giving me a boost, you know, so that I can, uh, you know, that's, that's the more difficult goal. Um, so easy goals had more satisfaction than difficult goals. And they thought their thinking behind this is probably because there's more wins when you reach for the low hanging fruit, right? If we're thinking about wins as like number of apples, it's, a, it's easy to get a lot of apples when there's a lot of apples that are hanging low, right? It's minimal effort on my part for maximum reward as in the apple, right? Even though the more difficult goals have higher performance, right? I perform more. I work more. I work harder when I have to reach for the, the apples that are up high, the, the more difficult goals, if you will. I have to reach for those. I have to work more for those. But at the end of it, whether I pick one apple from the low part of the tree or one apple from the high part of the tree, I still have an apple, right? As the TikTok sound goes, a win is a win. Whether, wherever I get it from, it's still a win, right? So easy goals might have more satisfaction because there's, it's easier to get wins. So you can get more wins. And it's more, it's more likely that you'll win with an easy goal than with a hard goal, which is why they think maybe easy goals had better satisfaction scores than harder goals, even though harder goals had better performance or more like higher performance. So that was a little ramble about affect and satisfaction in easy versus difficult goals. But from this, um, so the fifth science back tip that I'm going to walk away with is to the importance of setting achievable goals, right? I'm not going to pick up an apple that's on the floor. I'm going to reach a little bit, but I'm not going to go out of my way and like really strain myself and depend on somebody to give me a boost to get an apple that's impossible for me to reach. I'm going to shoot for an apple that is within my reach, maybe a little bit out of my reach that I can stretch a little bit, you know? 
I'm going to set an, I'm going to set a goal that's achievable, but still like not easy so that I will perform well, but still have the satisfaction of the, um, of the win of the apple, if you will, which is, it's actually crazy when you think about it. Cause I don't even like apples that much, but anyway, so that was my fifth tip for setting and working towards goals with science. Um, just a reminder about these smart goals. We want specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, relevant, and timely goals. And I think, like I said, smart goals wasn't referenced in the textbook chapter, but I think a lot of the findings that Locke summarized in his section were super relevant to SMART goals. Like everything that he found is summarized in the SMART goal idea. Um, so that's like a couple of big takeaways. Um, in addition to Dr. Locke's work, Dr. Latham also summarized some of his work in the textbook chapter. And Dr. Latham's work was more field research. So like I mentioned earlier, Locke's work was in a controlled environment in a laboratory setting, whereas Dr. Latham's work was actually more focused in the field, like field work. Specifically, he was looking at studying people's behavior in the workplace. And together with Locke, Latham's work contributed greatly to, you know, the existence of goal setting theory. Um, but one study in particular that Latham had mentioned, I found super interesting and it's something that I'm definitely going to take with me for my goals in 2023. So I wanted to summarize it here for you. So this was a study that focused on goals and self management. So it's not so much, setting goals and like how to best set a goal. It's more like managing yourself and your actions so that you reach this goal. So the study itself was in a state government setting. Um, that was sort of the field that he was in, was state government setting, where job attendance in this particular setting was low. So in this study, he summarized that there were two groups, right, of people who worked in this setting, right? One group was a control group where they had no intervention at all. The other group was enrolled in a self-management program. And this program consisted of one hour per week of group sessions for eight weeks, followed by 30 minute one-on-one -on -one sessions for eight weeks. And in these sessions, um, a couple of things were covered. Firstly, goal setting for job attendance. Um, so basically saying, okay, well, I, maybe I'm late five days a week. Maybe now my goal is to only be late twice a week or whatever. Um, so they would set a goal for their job attendance. And then after they set that goal, they would do self monitoring and they would, um, basically keep track for themselves how their attendance was going and they would plot it. Essentially they would keep track of it on a chart or on a graph. And then the third thing during these sessions that they did was they would write a behavioral contract. And in this contract, they would specify a reward for attaining the goal and they would specify a punishment for not attaining the goal. So let's just say my goal was, okay, I'm only late to work twice this week. If I'm only late to work twice this week, I get a reward. If I'm late to work four times this week, I have a punishment instead. Um, so that's sort of how the session worked, was they set the goal for themselves, they monitored themselves, and then they had a behavioral contract where they either got a reward or a punishment. And the results of the study was that they found that after three months, the self-set goal group had higher attendance to work uh, or a measure of performance and they had a higher confidence in their abilities for coming into work or self-efficacy. Um, so essentially this sort of intervention of a self-management 
goal setting program improved not only the performance, but also the self-efficacy of the workers who were in this group. And it actually worked so well that the chapter goes on to say that they expanded this program for all employees so that after this was expanded to all employees, the performance or the attendance of all employees improved after three months of it expanding to everybody who worked there which I thought, you know, that's pretty amazing, right? To have a program implemented that improved so many people's performance and so many people's self-efficacy so that it's, they now, it's now like sort of a standard thing. Now everybody gets access to this sort of uh, process. I just thought that was very cool. And I thought, you know what? If they can improve their job attendance so well, let me think about how did they do that? I want, I want whatever they're having, you know what I mean? I want to, you know, reach my goals just like they reach theirs. So what I thought was interesting, I wanted to really focus on what they did during the self-setting goal, self-set goal-setting session. So remember those three things that I talked about. One was the first thing that they did was they set the goal for themselves. And we know we've already talked about this a hundred times this episode. We want to set a smart goal. We want to set a specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and realistic, and timely goal. That's the first step. But next, once we're actually working towards the goal, which is like kind of the hard part, some might argue, everybody might argue, um, <laughs> it's important to do some self-monitoring. Um, and they did, they self-monitored their attendance right through charts. But whatever my goal may be, I want to self-monitor also. And this kind of gets back to the idea that we were talking about measuring feedback, right? We want to check in every so often and make sure that we're staying on track with our goals. And we need to, uh, you know, kind of keep ourselves responsible and make sure that we're making progress towards those goals and also evaluate what we're doing well and what we're maybe not doing well. If we don't meet this goal, you know, if we don't meet this measurement, um, you know, how can we pick up the pace or how can we, you know, change the way that we're doing something to get a better output? Um, so that's very important, self-monitoring for feedback. And then the third thing that they talked about was having a behavioral contract. And this kind of touches on what we talked about earlier with commitment and also with affect and satisfaction, right? So the behavioral contract that they had was basically setting a reward if we reach the goal and then setting a punishment if we don't reach the goal. And that keeps us committed to the goal. We don't want to do the punishment. We do want to get the reward. So we're going to be motivated and committed to reaching that goal each week. And if we do reach the goal each week, um, that improves our satisfaction and our overall mood and affect. Um, so these three things, setting the goal, self-monitoring, and behavioral contracts are things that I'm going to implement into my goal setting and my goal working towards my goals in 2023. And I'll get back to you and I'll let you know if it's a load of mumbo jumbo or if it's actually gonna work. We'll see. But I mean, science is on their side, you know? There's studies about it that say that it works, so we'll see. Um, but that's the summary for question one, the science back tips that I'm using for my 2023 goals. So now we'll move on to the second question, which are, what are my 2023 goals? Um, I have a couple, but I wanted to share with you maybe some that are relevant. M maybe you'll care about them because they're about this podcast. So here it is, my podcast goals for 2023. Um, I want to put out 40 more episodes. I think 40 was definitely doable. I think it's smart to include buffer time or breaks, um, one, because rest is important, and two, because life happens. So I figure 40 episodes was a good uh, amount for my first year. I'm going to do it again for the second year, 2023. And ideally, I'm going to have them organized into four blocks of 10 episodes, where the episode will be released every Friday during a winter block, spring, summer, and fall blocks. Um, so 10 episodes in a row followed by like three weeks of a break. Um, and the episodes will be released on Friday. 
when I first started releasing this podcast, I, I had it out on Tuesdays and that just didn't really, I kept pushing it back, pushing it back and pushing it back. And I think Friday is like a good day for me because I have like the weeknights after work to work on it and then Friday finish up and release it. So I'm going to stick with Friday releases. I also have some additional developments that I want to work on. Um, one thing that I talked about in the first episode that I did not mention here was this idea of learning goals and how your goals might, you can frame your goals to be more of a learning experience versus a, um, you know, just do the best that I can to actually get like a measurable learning outcome. Um, and there's a lot of things that I want to continue learning, especially now that I'm doing video episodes. Um, Thank you, by the way, for your patience with my video editing skills, which are absolute garbage. Um, but I, I definitely have some goals to improve the quality of the show, whether it's the quality of the video or just the episodes themselves. Um, hopefully, I want to get, by the end of 23, I want to get guests on the show and like have multiple voices represented here. I think that would be a lot of fun. So I do have a lot of ideas for additions to the show, additional developments that I'm aiming to get done in 2023 as well. In addition to just the podcast, I also want to sort of develop my social media presence. Um, right now, each episode gets one Instagram post pretty much, and then I post like links on Instagram stories. And I think what I want to do for 2023 is do three posts per episode where I'll have just like a general episode post, kind of like what I'm doing now, and then have a second post that's like a meme or a graphic that's like relevant to the topic of the episode. And then I also want to do like a reel or a TikTok that's like one minute summary of what the episode was about. Um, and I think that will help me grow my social media presence and my social media audience, especially for like the reels and the TikToks. I think a lot of people like this sort of, sort of shorthand bursts of information. And then um, th it's like easy to share so you can like get the word out about it. Um, so I think that's kind of what I'm looking to move towards in 2023 is three posts per week in an attempt to grow my social media presence. I also want to start doing some more um, like social media campaigns, movements. I have some ideas. I don't want to give it away too soon, but my stupid chair, so creaky. Um, <laughs> I don't want to give it away too soon, but I do have some ideas that are building um, that I want to just be more active on social media. And in doing that, not only just me being active, but like, having participation with the people who follow as well, um, the people who follow along, all of you, hopefully. Um, so there will be ways to like be involved with the audience. That that's something that I definitely want to do in the upcoming year. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I want to implement self-monitoring through charts, just like the, the Latham study talked about where, um, you know, at the end of each month, I'm going to count, like count up the, you know, number of followers on Instagram, the number of downloads on Spotify, you know, and, and just keep a tally of that so that I can have a better idea of how my performance is going through the year and, um, you know, get a, get an idea of what people resonate with or what people are not interested in so that I can better define this project, this podcast. So um, I will be doing self-monitoring each month to uh, measure my progress. And then finally, the behavioral contract. Um, I haven't written it out yet, but I definitely do want to have a behavioral contract because I think it's a really good way to keep myself accountable um, especially not so much the reward so much as the punishment, right? Like if I, if I skip, you know, two episodes in a row, maybe my punishment is like put up a very unflattering picture of myself on my story or something like, I don't know, something that like, I really don't want to do that. So I have to do this instead. I have to reach my goal because I don't want to be, I don't want to do that punishment sort of thing. 
Um, so I really actually liked that idea, and I am going to write one before the new year starts. So um, maybe not an embarrassing selfie, though. I don't know. I think I'm too coward for that. But maybe that's the point, right? Anyway, um, those are my 2023 goals and how I'm going to work towards them. And uh, I hope you appreciated that bit of transparency. It's actually maybe I'll rely on you two to keep me accountable. Um, now that it's out in the open and it's like public knowledge, you have full permission to like bully me if I abandon my goal. Be like, Sam, you told us 40 episodes this year and it's June and you've put out three, you know, um, hopefully that won't happen. But now that it's public knowledge and it's out there for everyone to know, you now have permission to bully me into working towards my goal. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the takeaways from this episode, hopefully you got at least one, maybe a couple of good tips that will help you set and achieve your SMART goals for 2023. Um, and before we end the episode, I did just want to give a sincere and heartfelt thank you for following along this year. I, The podcast has been an idea in my head for a long time, actually. And to actually like do it, to record it, to produce it, to edit it, to put it out and advertise it is was definitely a growing point in my life. I'm, if you know me in person, you probably are like very surprised that I have a podcast because I don't seem like the type of person to like put myself out there. Um, but I, I did and I am, and it's, it's been a, a huge growth in my life, in my personality. And, um, I don't think that I would have done it or stuck to it if I didn't have the support of people on Instagram, on Twitter, in real life, people texting me saying, oh, I love this episode, or, you know, people um, submitting questions and, like, wanting to learn more about science. Um, that's what this is all about, by the way, is science and my love for science and hoping that everybody else loves science, too. Um, but it's been a, a, a really great year for my development, and I really appreciate those of you who followed along Maybe you only listened to like two or three episodes. Doesn't matter. Even if you listen to one, thank you so much. I really appreciate your support and spending time with me. And um, I hope that 2023 will live up to your Sam's Planning Science expectations. I will do my best. Okay. Heartfelt over. Ugh. Disgusting. Let's get to the closing. <laughs> all right. That's all for this week. That's all for this year. Uh Okay, please don't forget to follow, rate, and review the podcast wherever you're listening. And you can also subscribe on YouTube, please. You can follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Sam's Planning Sci. You can connect with me there and ask questions if you'd like. And you can also submit your questions to samsplainingscience.com slash ask. So if you have anything that you want Sam's Plain to you, ask away. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. I hope you learned a little bit and laughed a little bit. And I will talk to you on Friday. Pinky swear. I'll be there. Will you? I hope so. Okay. Happy New Year. Talk to you soon. Bye.